Prosecutors say Isabella Guzman stabbed her mother 79 times. She is acting like a brat in court, mugging for the camera like, hey, she's got to do study hall. I was not myself. Or if I could take it back, I would. I'm not evil. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. You scared the hell out of me. Because you have no conscience. August 28th, 2013. Isabella Guzman stabbed her mom, Yanmi Ho, to death at their home in Aurora, Colorado. Seven years later, a video of Guzman making funny facial gestures in court went viral on TikTok, making her an instant internet sensation. But one question was looming in the minds of avid TikTok users. What exactly led Isabella to commit such a disturbing act on her own mother? Isabella had behavioral issues at a young age. Her mother would send her to live with her biological father, Robert Guzman, when she was around seven years old, due to these concerns. However, when all seemed okay, Isabella would move back with her mother, Hoy, but she continued struggling throughout her teenage years, leading her to drop out of school. August 2013, the relationship between Guzman and her mother became worse than ever. According to her stepfather, Ryan Ho, Guzman became more threatening and disrespectful towards her mother. It got so bad that Mi Ho had to call the cops on Guzman, but the cops didn't think much of it, leading him to offer just a few words of counseling. Sadly, this didn't do much because the same night, Isabella got into this heated argument with her mother, ending with Guzman spitting in her mom's face. This would be one of many red flags displayed by Isabella, and she wasn't finished. Hoy received an email from her daughter the next morning that simply read, You will pay. Terrified, Hoy would call the police again. They arrived at the house that afternoon and spoke with Guzman, telling her that her mom could legally kick her out if she didn't start respecting her and following the rules. Hoy also called Isabella's biological father and asked him to come have a talk with his daughter. Robert came around that evening, sat in the backyard with Isabella and had a very lengthy father-daughter talk about respecting her mother and her stepfather. At this point, it seemed like he was getting through to her, but later that evening, he received a phone call that made it obvious his words had no meaning to Isabella. On the night of August 28, 2013, Yunmi Ho arrived at home from work at around 9.30 p.m. She told her husband she was heading upstairs to take a shower, and that's when he soon heard a thud, followed by terrifying screams. Ryan Hoy rushed upstairs just in time to see Isabella slamming the bathroom door shut. He tried to push through, but Guzman had it locked and was pushing against the other side. When he saw blood seeping beneath the door, he raced back downstairs to call 911. When Ryan returned to force the door open, he heard his wife shout out Jehovah, and then saw Guzman open the door and walk out with a bloody knife. At that moment, all fell silent. Isabella, covered in blood, walked right past him without saying anything. As soon as she left, he ran into the bathroom and found his wife naked on the floor with a baseball bat beside her, covered in many stab wounds. He tried resuscitating her, but she was already dead. Investigators later found her throat had been slashed and she'd been stabbed at least 79 times in the head, neck, and torso. By the time police arrived, Isabella had fled. They quickly launched a manhunt, informing the public that Guzman was armed and dangerous. But almost after 16 hours of searching, officers found her at a nearby parking garage. Her pink sports bra and turquoise shorts were covered in her mother's blood. September 5, 2013, Guzman had been dragged out of her cell for court arraignment. And when she finally got to that courtroom, she made a series of bizarre faces towards the camera smirking and pointing her eyes. She pled not guilty by reason of insanity. With a doctor testifying on her behalf, he claimed that she was suffering from schizophrenia and had experienced delusions for years. He went further to say that she hadn't even realized she was stabbing her mother. Rather, Guzman thought she was killing a woman named Cecilia in order to save the world. To the prosecutor's shock, the judge accepted Guzman's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity and sent her to the Colorado Mental Health Institute in Pueblo, where she would stay until she was no longer a danger to herself or her community. While that seemed like the end of her story, it was actually just the beginning. In 2020, various TikTok users began posting Guzman's 2013 arraignment. They even had a soundtrack with Ava Max singing Sweet But Psycho. 
Other video showed people imitating Guzman's odd facial expressions from the courtroom. But overall, Isabella quickly gained a fan base online. People noted how beautiful she was and said she must have had a good reason for killing her mom. I know, TikTok people be crazy. One video compilation of her court hearing gained nearly 2 million views, with a lot more people making fan pages in Guzman's honor on Facebook and Instagram. Meanwhile, she's at that health institute undergoing therapy and trying to find the proper medication for her schizophrenia. In November 2020, she petitioned the court for her release, claiming that she was no longer a threat to those around her. In her words, I wasn't myself when I did that, and I have since been restored to full health. I'm not mentally ill anymore. I'm not a danger to myself or others. She went on to claim she suffered years of abuse at the hands of her mother. However, all these might just be claims to get that early release. June 2021, Isabella Guzman was granted permission to leave that mental institution for therapy sessions. This was her first time outside in years, and despite her allegedly abusive relationship with her mother, she said of the events that occurred in her life, she wishes she never attacked her mother that evening. Number 4. Claire Miller February 2021, 14-year-old Claire Miller had amassed an impressive following of around 22,000 people on TikTok thanks to her lip-syncing abilities. Offline, however, she spent her days among 550 indifferent students at Lancaster Country Day School in Eastern Pennsylvania. And at home, she often felt overshadowed by her 19-year-old sister, Helen. These, among many other reasons, led Claire down that dark path of taking her sister's life in a manner beyond human comprehension. Born in 2007 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Claire Elena Miller was raised by loving parents Mark and Mary Miller. While she was a healthy child, her older sister Helen wasn't as lucky. Helen had cerebral palsy, resulting in her spending a huge part of her life bound to a wheelchair. Helen also required frequent assistance, with Claire being the major person around to help out. Both her and her older sister attended the private Lancaster Country Day School. After school, Miller mostly spent her days in the solace of her room, posting videos on her at Spirits and Such Consulting TikTok account. Most of these videos were harmless, showing Miller lip-syncing to sad pop songs or dancing around in her room. Others depicted her jovial father making silly faces, playing guitar, or jokingly acknowledging Miller's camera. She would commonly reenact popular anime memes, which her father presumably found somewhat eccentric. Now, with this description, she seemed like a harmless teenage girl, incapable of harming a fly, but on the inside was a spirit much darker. February 22, 2021. It appeared to be a normal Sunday evening when the Miller family said their goodnights and went to their individual beds. Now, it's unclear how long Claire Miller had planned to kill her sister, if at all but she crept into Helen's room at around 1 a.m. with a knife from the family kitchen. Miller stabbed Helen in the neck several times before placing a pillow over her face to finish the job. When it was done, she called the police at 1.08 a.m. and told the Mannheim Township emergency dispatcher that she had killed her sister. Police would arrive within five minutes and find Miller waiting outside. She sat on the front porch saying the words, I stabbed my sister. While authorities initially believed Miller was traumatized as the result of some unknown family accident, they couldn't help but note her appearance. Miller's blue t-shirt was emblazoned with a cat's face, and her checkered pajama pants were drenched in blood. Plus, the red pile of snow next to her was evidence she was trying to clean off her hands. When Miller told the cops that her dead sister was in bed, police entered the residence. Tragically, Mark and Mary had no idea what had occurred until armed cops flooded the bloody crime scene. And only then did they realize that their disabled daughter had been stabbed to death. They found Helen in an extremely disturbing state, with her upper body filled with stab wounds. Police attempted to resuscitate her while waiting for emergency services. Unfortunately, it was far too late and she was pronounced dead at 4.13 a.m. Claire was taken into custody and charged with criminal homicide. That's where her story takes a huge twist. At first, everyone, including her parents, felt the murder wasn't premeditated and was probably an accident. However, the idea of that changed the moment Claire was offered a box of McDonald's and she said, Oh, McDonald's, I would have killed someone sooner if I knew I was going to get McDonald's. As if that wasn't bad enough. Claire went on to make this derogatory statement about the murder by saying, 
she Michael Myered her sister, referring to that character from 1978 Halloween. After a psychological evaluation, the psychiatrist claimed Claire suffered from auditory hallucinations and that she attempted to cut her own throat the same night she killed her sister. April 16, 2021, Claire pled not guilty to the charge against her, despite calling the cops herself to report the crime. Her attorney subsequently requested a hearing in order to shift Miller's homicide prosecution at juvenile court and filed a notice for a potential insanity defense. But the court dismissed this. More disturbingly, her TikTok following exploded by nearly 11,000 once the news of the murder broke, and her final post scored millions of views before TikTok removed that account entirely. After more than a year on trial, Claire finally pled guilty to third-degree murder, and although she was ruled mentally ill but not mentally disabled, she was sentenced to spend a minimum of 12 and a half years and a maximum of 40 years in prison. On the other side of things, her school published a statement of grief in light of the tragedy, but no amount of mourning could possibly match that of Mark and Mary Miller. There's no way to simply process what parents who lost both their children in one night must be going through. In his sentencing, the judge felt compassion for the parents by saying these words, The usual chasm between the prosecution and defense tables collapses today. Mr. and Mrs. Miller face the heartbreaking challenge of sitting in support of both the victim and the accused for a family who has already faced such great loss. Today's proceedings undoubtedly risk intensifying the pain that has defined the past two years. Number 3. Nicola Priest That was the last seen footage of TikToker Nicola Priest and her daughter before Nicola killed the child for interrupting her during sex. From Solihull, England, Nicola Priest was a 23-year-old mother and influencer of some sort. She would post TikTok videos on and off in hopes of gaining fame and attention. While her audience weren't such diehard fans of Nicola, they adored her little daughter, Kaylee J.D. Priest. Her fans noticed in TikTok videos that Kaylee J.D. Priest showed signs of abuse on her body, but they didn't think much of it. They believed she may have just fell while playing and hurt herself. However, there was more to that. Nicola and her 22-year-old boyfriend, Callum Redfern, used this little girl as a punching bag. They would occasionally beat her up with the intention of causing serious harm. One night, Callum came over to Nicola's apartment in hopes that he'd be getting lucky. However, due to that kid's constant crying, they couldn't focus on having a good time. And why was Kaylee crying? Maybe because of the abuse, she was vomiting severely. The couple had lost their temper when Kaylee wouldn't stop crying, so they beat her up so brutally that she died on the spot. Being a terrible mother did get heads turning, but what caught the attention of the public was the fact that Nicola had no remorse or guilt for her actions. Just weeks after killing her own child, this evil murderous person went live and danced shamelessly on TikTok. She went on to exploit her daughter's death for more TikTok fame. She posted numerous RIP videos on her account, getting her fans to sympathize with her. As disgusting as that sounds, she was already under investigation for her daughter's death, and after substantial evidence was obtained. She and her boyfriend were charged with the murder. Nicola was handed 15 years, with her boyfriend having 14, being that he was also involved in this. They're both currently in jail, but it doesn't take away the fact that that poor innocent child deserved better than her mother calling her a little bitch, leaving her in dirty diapers for days, and eventually taking her life. Number 2. Jin Kid. August 21st, 2021, Ali Nassar Abulaban, known as Jin Kid, took the lives of his wife and her male friend at their apartment. For those of you who really don't know who this guy is, Jin Kid and his wife portrayed what appeared to be a happy relationship online. For context, it's the facade of a perfect marriage, showcased on social media platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, often hiding the complex reality of people's real lives. For Jin Kid, his transformation into that character he often portrayed Tony Montana, raised questions about the extent to which his social media personas actually influenced his real-life actions. Before this horrendous incident, though, Ali had a substantial following. He had nearly a million followers on TikTok and 170,000 on YouTube, with a total of about 25 million views. He posted videos of his applaudable impressions of Tony Montana from Scarface, as well as impressions of rapper 6 ix 9 But most importantly, he posted videos of his healthy relationship with his family. He projected an image of marital harmony through shared videos with his wife, Anna. However, their relationship was marred by turmoil, with Anna contemplating legal action due to some domestic violence allegations. Despite agreeing to leave their shared apartment to avoid escalating the situation, Ali still had the spare keys. 
leading to this catastrophic event. He would install software on their daughter's iPad, allowing him to eavesdrop on conversations in the apartment. On the day of the incident, the spyware planted on the device grabbed his wife giggling with an unknown man, making Jin Kid react irrationally. He grabbed his shotgun, went to their apartment, used his spare key, and brutally shot on his male friend three times before shooting her as well. Feeling terrible after that, he left and called his mom to admit what he did. He went to pick up his daughter from school, also telling her what he had done. Jin Kid later called the cops while driving home with his daughter. Then he'd be arrested after security cameras caught him rushing in and out of the apartment. At first, he cooperated with the police. But things got complicated when he pled not guilty during his trial. Now the prosecutors are pushing for the max punishment, probably the death penalty, if he's found guilty. And number one, Aman Sami Magdid. March 6, 2022, Aman, a prominent figure on TikTok known for her bold presence in Iraq, tragically met her end in what seemed to be an honor killing committed by her own brother. The motive? Well, I hate to break it to you, but this motive was actually linked to her choice of clothing and an open lifestyle on social media. At 20 years old, Magdid fell victim to her 17-year-old brother, who fatally shot her on a street in Erbil, Iraq, recognized as Mary or Mar Maria by her 47,000 TikTok followers. She became known for sharing content some considered rebellious on social media. This encompassed photos of her in crop tops revealing her midriff, smoking, displaying a crucifix, and expressing opinions that challenged the traditional norms in a deeply conservative Iraqi society. Although she still practiced Islam and didn't convert to Christianity, her choice of clothing and accessories were mainly a fashion statement which angered her family. Her brother disapproved of her defiance of traditional clothing norms based on Islamic beliefs and felt she blatantly disrespected Islamic customs. So on a road he would wait for in the city of Erbil, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Then once he saw her, he fired eight shots, killing her on the spot. He was later apprehended by police, but no one knows for certain what happened to him afterward. As you might have guessed, her death caused a lot of outrage online. Plus, she wasn't the only one to have been a victim of such honor killings. Within slightly over two months of the incident, over 10 women in Iraq's Kurdistan region faced similar fates, including the untimely death of Doski Azad, a 23-year-old trans woman allegedly killed by her brother. Azad frequently changed residences out of fear and was found abandoned in a ditch after her tragic demise. This tragedy, like the others we've discussed, shows how mixing online personas with reality can have serious consequences. Behind the perfect image on social media, there's often a more complicated, sometimes really troubling reality. It does manipulate our own version of reality and the people around us. But the underlying question is, is social media just a bittersweet curse to our generation?